Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anais Petitjean, and I am the FarmD COP analyst. And I welcome you all to this new session about strengthening the role of financial services in bolstering climate resilience of the poor and vulnerable, especially women, which is co-organized by the Inclusive Rural Finance Network and the platform for agricultural risk management through FarmD. As some of you may know, uh, IRF Network is a PMI, Inclusive Rural Finance Desk, collaboration with PAM, and it aims to provide a space for knowledge sharing to foster coordination among IRF uh, practitioners at IFAD. Uh, the network is uh, currently hosted within FarmD, which is the community of practice hosted and managed by PAM to share, learn, and exchange about agricultural risk management issues and feed lively discussion uh, around these topics. But I am glad to provide you with more details in the chat box uh, right now. And uh, in the meantime and before leaving the floor, I just wanted to quickly remind you about the Q&A session that we'll have through the presentation. So you are more than uh, welcome to raise your hand, make your question or type it into the chat box. And now, without further ado, I'd like to invite Mark to take the floor for his introduction and the moderation of this event. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Anais. And again, welcome to the to our first event as one of our team leaders. It's really great uh, to have Parm helping us out. Um, well, many of you know that uh, in 2021, uh, IFAD published a new inclusive rural finance policy. And I don't think the timing could have been better. Um, we were looking at different trends that were gathering speed. Um, in fact, the large waves of speed in front of us, and two in particular, uh, digitization and uh, climate finance, um, really were starting to cause us to think, wow, what have we been doing in the past and what do we need to do in the future? And so um, part, of the, part of the work in the inclusive rural finance policy was to try and and understand you know, how we can put some guidelines or rails together and really just emphasize the importance of, of climate finance in this, in this particular case. Other things as well, digital, as I mentioned. Um, and as part of uh, the inclusive rural finance policy, we have an action plan, which we work on every year, and that's to produce uh, knowledge, knowledge uh, raising, uh, training, capacity building, learning tools, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, Climate finance has been sort of one that we've kind of learned on the fly. Um, and my colleagues and I have been busy at this since I got here in 2020 at the EFAD. Um, and it's been something that we've been learning as we've been doing. So uh, I think it was in 2021, CGAP uh, declared that it was going to get serious about climate. And that was fantastic for us. And they've done a bang up job really in, in focusing some resources and some big brain power on the topic. And, and that's basically why we um, wanted to invite them to speak today. Um, we know that it's a key uh, strategic and uh, programming theme for us uh, here at EFAD. Um, and we've taken kind of a leadership role in some respects, at least at the smallholder farm level. As many of you know, like 70% of, of food in many countries, as much as 70% is, is uh, produced by smallholders and they're the most vulnerable to, to climate change. And they're actually seeing it on the farm. We've done uh, lots of focus groups, the digital uh, surveys, and we know that they know um, whether it's increasing saline in their uh, soil or lack of rain or you know bushfires, all these things are affecting them. And what we've been trying to figure out in the last little while, and it's not the easiest thing to do, is how do we help them with finance? Uh, and I, I'll, I'll conclude by saying, I want to point out a real difference that one of my colleagues made um, in Lorna Grace, uh, who, and, and she said, you know, there's a big difference between climate finance and climate funding. And it's so true. And, and the analogy for me is like late 90s, early 2000s, when there was a lot of supply driven, uh, a lot of supply driven um, interest in, in, in microfinance at the time, we call it inclusive finance now, of course. And, and it feels a lot like the same. And I think the, the other, so the feeling that I have uh, before I introduce our CGAP speakers is that, you know, we have a moment to fix, the, to figure this out, how to do it well. This is not easy because it also often involves asset purchase technology, adaptation technology, or uh, mitigation uh, 
assets. And it's a different kind of lending that we're used to. And people are poor and they can't afford these big assets. So how do we do this? How can we do it differently? And how can we do it at scale? That's just some ideas I'm throwing on the table before we get going. And uh, we hear from our speakers, which I will introduce. Uh, we have Peter uh, Zetterly, who's a senior financial uh, sector specialist uh, from CGAP, and Sylvia uh, Bar Zabek. Ooh, did I get it right? Um, who's going to talk about some of the things that CGAP has been investigating uh, and doing a few deep dives in? And I'll let you guys explain it uh, more than uh, my I will. We try to keep, finally, we try to keep these um, events fairly informal uh, and flowing and have a lot of fun. Uh, ask questions in the uh, chat box when the speakers are speaking. And if they decide to answer it at the time, they will, or just save it. And we'll take some time after um, after um, the initial presentation. Um, sorry, uh, session one, maybe we'll take a few question answers then. And then after that uh, session, we'll, uh, we'll have some more time for comments. So without further ado, I leave it up to our CGAP uh, colleagues, and I think Peter is going to speak first. That's right. Um, thank you so much, Mark, and thanks for the lovely introduction. I hope we can uh, do justice to the big brain power moniker that you gave us. Let me uh, go ahead and share the screen and hope that you can see what's going on now. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and give control to Sylvia while we're at it. So it's a, it's a great pleasure. Okay, that should be good already. Great pleasure to be here. Thanks so very much uh, for inviting us and thanks for the intro. Um, uh, since you have our bios and uh, and so forth, I won't say much more about myself except to say that I lead our new work on climate change. Sylvia leads the component on funders and those are the two pieces that we wanna sort of talk about at a, at a high level today. Uh, although we've been thinking about it as, as Mark alluded to for a couple of years, this is still very much a new area for CCAP. Uh, we've only done initial scoping work so far. We're very conscious of how complex climate change is and how complex the nexus between climate change and financial inclusion is. Um, and we're very humble about that. So we're, we, we're cognizant that we're only scratching the surface of the, all this complexity. Um, but it is an important agenda uh, and we expect that it will be a very significant agenda for CGAP and for the financial inclusion community uh, going forward. Uh, so it's high time that, that we got underway and did some real work on it. The background for this question, similar to what, what Mark was saying about your own inclusive rural finance strategy, is that for a number of years CGAP has kind of, we've tried to orient ourselves more clearly around the question of financial services for what? Can we have a clear review and, and outcomes that we hope financial inclusion will lead to? Uh, and if so, how does that impact what we do and how we do it? Um, and we're just uh, uh, finalizing our next five-year strategy. We operate in five-year strategy cycles. And that really centers on the role of financial inclusion enabling green, resilient, and inclusive uh, development. And each of those is, is a key outcome area for us that we're gonna be working toward through financial inclusion. The green outcome area revolves largely around climate change, notably around climate adaptation and climate resilience. There's some mitigation elements in there too, but, but that's primarily the, the focus. Uh, so, oh, I see this agenda slide has popped in here. That's wonderful. Um, we are gonna have a couple of pieces to this. First, I'm gonna talk at a high level what our findings from the scoping work have been. Uh, we will, I'll talk for you know, 10, 15 minutes, then welcome, you know, uh, we'll spend about the same amount of time, I think, on questions and, and reactions and comments. And then we'll spend a little bit of time diving into Sylvia's work on the funder work stream uh, and, and have some Q&A on that and wrap up by talking a little bit about where we see, uh, where CGEP sees our own agenda going forward. And I have a couple of colleagues uh, on the call, Jamie and Max, who are uh, taking the lead on a couple of those uh, agendas that are coming out of this. So, that's how we see the work in general. Um, just to say that um, by sort of prefacing this climate work overall, in recognition of the complexity of the space, we've taken a sort of a phased approach to the work um, with an initial more exploratory phase aimed at more foundational learning and sort of orienting ourselves in the space. Um, we pursued a series of learning questions and we're looking at 
the question of the nexus of climate and financial inclusion through six different lenses. So through the lens of, of customers, providers, funders, financial regulators, social protection players, and gender as a cross-cutting lens. And we had sort of learning questions associated with all those. We're gonna be publishing our findings on all that. We sort of have, we've done that foundational work. We're gonna be disseminating it over the next few months and then start a second phase of more applied work in a number of different directions. Um, as part of our initial phase, we, we identified eight distinct research agendas that we think CGAP or, or others in the financial community, uh, financial inclusion community should be considering pursuing in this nexus. Um, and we articulated an initial perspective or narrative on what that nexus looks like. And that's what I'm gonna be sharing with you now at a, at a high level uh, and then over to, and then we'll have some Q&A and then over to, to Sylvia to talk about the funders specifically. So um, we have big picture, six broad takeaways from our initial six to nine months scoping uh, from this. And the first of those is, centers on this question of is financial inclusion even relevant for climate change? And the answer is, and that question is posed by a lot of people uh, when we present our new uh, strategy, we get a lot of questions around why, what does this even have to do with climate change? And our initial takeaway there is absolutely, there is are plenty of connections here that we could talk for a long time about the role of savings and insurance and credit and remittances and climate risk management. We don't need to do that now because I believe you, you guys if anyone sees those connections um, quite clearly as well. Maybe the bigger part of our takeaway here though, is that our, our sense that the business as usual isn't going to get us there for a couple of different reasons. Um, we can't just assume that more of the same, more financial inclusion will automatically bolster climate adaptation. We need to know a lot more about what combinations, what features of services best build resilience to different risks and contexts and livelihoods and segments, and we just don't have all of that detail yet. So as you no doubt are aware, you know, dealing with, if you're a Nigerian cassava farmer, dealing with long-term adaptation to water scarcity, or if you're a Bangladeshi uh, petty trader dealing uh, with, uh, you know, an, an emergency flood situation, those are very different circumstances. The, the things that you need to do in order to, to be resilient and to recover are gonna be very different. And so what you need from the financial system is also gonna be very different. And we need to get a better sense of, of those differences in order to maximize the usefulness of the financial system of, and of financial inclusion for, for a climate resilience and adaptation. Secondly, we think business cases might be harder to build for adaptation finance. I think that's what Mark alluded to earlier about climate finance, climate funding, and we'll, we'll get back to that in a moment. But uh, uh, adaptation investments have involved long, much longer time horizons than at my finance loans, usually 12, 18 months. It, it's based on a counterfactual around what didn't happen, which is, can be hard to value. It doesn't generate any new revenue oftentimes. So it's very different from the sort of traditional productive lending that my finance institutions do. And it's probably gonna be harder to build commercially viable business cases around. Um, and finally, of course, financial services carry their own risks. We're very conscious of the, the risk of over indebtedness in particular as people reach for credit as a way to cope uh, in, in some of these circumstances. So those are just a few reasons why, why we think that we need to be more deliberate about the role of financial inclusion and not just expect that it will all sort of figure itself out. The second reason is that, the um, you know, second broad takeaway is that the financial service provider community broadly speaking has not come very far on this topic. Uh, we have interviewed so far, we're still going, but around 60 or so financial service providers from MFIs to commercial banks, to FinTechs, to insurance players, to remittance players, just to get a sense of where everybody's at on climate. And, and with a few exceptions, the insurance space being one, working on, on climate for many years, but of course the inclusive element is, is the, continues to be the struggle there. There are a few MFIs in certain countries that are heavily climate exposed, like Black Bangladesh and so forth, that have a lot of experience on dealing with climate. But otherwise, what we hear from most of the writers is the climate change is just not a top priority. They have other things on their mind. They're still reeling from COVID and supply chain uh, shocks and rising inflation and all these things. And climate is just something uh, that has to wait until some future date when they feel like they have the bandwidth to worry about it. Many of them say even if climate was a priority, they don't have the data, they don't have the expertise, they wouldn't know how to build products for 
for to meet their clients' climate resilience needs. And by the way, they're not hearing any demand for uh, uh, products that respond to, to climate change and to the need for climate resilience and adaptation, uh, which is uh, somewhat striking given what we what we know about uh, uh, the how the effects of climate change are ramping up and there seeming to be an obvious need. So there's some kind of disconnect between the demand and the supply side here that, that is problematic. All that's not to say that the financial service providers aren't doing anything uh, on climate. Uh, many of them are, but the, what they, the actions that they are taking don't tend to center on their clients' resilience and adaptation. So if we look at the sort of financial service, the, the banking side of the space, much of what we're hearing revolves around one of two things or both. Uh, lending for the green economy, so there's a lot of excitement about all the new ESG money and lending for you know, renewables or recycling industries or whatever it might be, all of which is great, um, but doesn't necessarily bolster climate resilience and adaptation. Um, and secondly, climate risk assessments, which many of them are now doing partly for their own reasons, partly because they can see regulators and funders wanting to get a lot more into this and getting a better sense of climate risk. Uh, but that those climate risk assessments, which are happening all the way from individual loan committees all the way up to group levels, focus on the, the financial service providers themselves and their resilience climate, not on their clients. And the, 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 client, the climate risk and the climate resilience of their clients shows up largely as a portfolio quality question in that context, which is a little risky because the obviously easiest way to fix that portfolio quality issue is to start dropping clients who are, are climate uh, exposed and climate risky, which is which is not what we want. So we need a, a different approach to this from the financial provider community, a financial service provider community, uh, and a sort of greater sense of urgency on on meeting the needs that are out there. Uh, our third takeaway centers on the opposite question: Will climate change have any implications for for financial inclusion? Uh, and our answer again is absolutely. Uh, we see a real risk that climate change is going to push back. Uh, some of the advances that we've made on financial inclusion. Simply put, because it makes climate, it makes uh, clients that are already risky and hard to serve even riskier and, and even harder to serve. Uh, secondly, because providers themselves are vulnerable to climate risk and some of them struggle to deal with that. So on the one hand, there's the sort of operational question um, uh, of how do you keep your branches open? How do you keep serving people when there's a catastrophic flood or, or something of that ilk? Uh, on the other hand, there's the more, uh, the, the sort of longer term or existential question of how much climate risk can I deal with and how do I manage that? So uh, we, we have a number of sort of anecdotal examples of, of both of these things. Uh, when it comes to clients becoming riskier, uh, the main concern out of all of this is that uh, furnished service providers will ultimately need to retreat from certain contexts, right? Certain geographies, certain value chains that are just becoming too climate risky. So we spoke to a major uh, MFI in Nigeria uh, just last week um, who said, you know, you live in certain parts of Lagos, I'm not gonna lend to you because there's flooding there every single year and it's just too risky. So if you live in that part, I'm not gonna serve you, but that part of town. Um, to the second point about the risk that providers face, we spoke to another uh, major international NGO um, after the, uh, or, or, or my client's organization after the Pakistan floods, and they said, look, when the flood waters recede, it's not evident that we're all going to be here after that because of the, the heavy losses that our clients have taken. That's a heavy hit on our balance sheet. Uh, our, we have not been able to get, get uh, insurance for that, climate risk insurance uh, for, them, for the MFI itself because it's, it's too expensive and hard to come by, and our funders aren't necessarily willing to put up uh, the first loss capital and to replenish balance sheets. And so bottom line, these things are going to keep happening. Clients are going to get more risky. Providers are going to deal with more risk. We need to help figure out how these providers can stay in those areas, keep serving their clients. Otherwise, it seems obvious that financial inclusion will, will recede as climate risk uh, mounts. We think that there are some particular risks around the responses to climate change as well, and the, the efforts to green the financial system that, that could potentially have unintended consequences and, and drive greater exclusion. New regulatory requirements that up the ante on climate risk will steer banking the banking system away from climate risk to clients. That's kind of what it's designed to do, right? 
New reporting and disclosure requirements raise transaction costs and, and make it harder to serve the poorest clients. Um, funders and investors earmarking funds for green purposes uh, means there are less uh, there's less money to go around for non-green purposes, and the clients who may not have any op option to be green or uh, any way of proving that they're green, maybe they are green, but they are too poor to participate in the certification schemes that prove that they are, um, and so forth. So there are a number of different ways in which these very laudable efforts uh, could create uh, unintended consequences in contributing to greater financial exclusion. Our sense is, though, is that those risks are not really well understood or being actively managed. National regulators are all writing climate strategies, uh, but uh, they are not considering financial inclusion or the resilience of clients in that context. They're worried about financial stability, right? Which is maybe not surprising, but does raise concerns about missed opportunities and unintended consequences. The global standard setters don't seem to have these risks on their agenda either. We scoured all the documents of the Basel Committee and the CCSE and the NGFS and whatnot around climate risk, and the word financial inclusion doesn't appear once in, in any of those documents. Um, and we're not hearing an active discussion in the funder community either. Our sense is that funders still see financial access mainly as a means to climate mitigation, so that lending for the green economy and the green economic transition, uh, which is important. Uh, but the question of res resilience and adaptation is only more recently starting to get on agendas. And these concerns around the risks to financial inclusion are not really on anybody's agenda or talked about and the risk of unintended consequences uh, the same. So um, there are concerns about that. And given the huge momentum behind this push for greening the financial sector, that, that makes us uh, a little bit worried. Um, fifth takeaway is that public financing, going back to the earlier point about business cases, is going to be central here to build markets, complement markets, extend markets. Simply put, there are large risks to a lot of vulnerable people that will never be covered on a commercial basis by markets. That, that, that seems uh, fairly straightforward to say. There are insurance markets in even very rich parts of the world that are becoming difficult. You can't insure property in Florida anymore, basically. Uh, and as climate change increases, those concerns are already, uh, are just gonna grow, right? So there's gonna be a big role for public uh, financing here. And what that role looks like is, is part of the conversation that we need to have. Social protection is gonna be one important part of that, uh, but social protection needs to evolve itself. It needs to have the right capacity and sufficient financing in order to, to play uh, a useful role on that. Um, and more broadly, we might need a new conversation about the role of public finance, return expectations around public finance, uh, maybe even raising the S word around subsidies, uh, uh, because that may ultimately be the only way that we're going to get to be able to cover uh, poor people with climate risk insurance, for instance. Um, and, and the sixth takeaway, uh, last but very much not least, is that women are both more climate vulnerable and more financially excluded, and those issues are, are really intersecting and compounding one another, not least around agriculture, of course. Uh, and so we need to work on on financial inclusion, climate adaptation, and gender all together. Uh, and those agendas are, are too often sort of standalone, separate agendas, uh, and we think they, they need to be all addressed uh, together to meet the uh, needs of, of women in this context. So let me stop there, and maybe I should stop screen sharing, I don't know, uh, and open up for questions. I haven't been able to monitor the chat, um, but let me pop that out, and then happy to take any questions from anybody. I'll let you moderate, Mark, if you want, or however yeah, you want. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I don't see any hands, but I'm not the best moderator on this, this planet here. Um, I don't see any hands. Does anybody want a question? I've got a couple, but, um, but I'd rather take some from others. Ah, we see Anjali. I hope I got your name right. Anja, go ahead. Yes, spot on. Um, thanks, Mark. So, Peter, all very interesting. Question is, in the conversations or in the research that's been done um, for financial service providers, where, if at all, you know, in, in those conversations has any of the climate-related financial disclosures potentially come up as either a source of identifying climate 
as a risk and certainly the this particular population vulnerable population we're talking about as part of that um and if not do you see um there being opportunities for momentum through through that lens knowing that most banks and financial services indeed insurance organizations are beholden right and held to account through that framework yeah, so, so disclosures do come up a lot in a few different contexts. Uh, and in some cases, funders are asking for for disclosures on anything related to climate and climate finance. In other con con contexts and countries, regulators are asking for it. Uh, we spoke with, uh, I guess it was ProCredit Ecuador last week, who's saying that the regulator had asked them to sort of submit data on all of their climate anything that had to do with climate mitigation or climate adaptation and they were trying to figure out what either of those terms means in that context and for some of the ones that have you know benefits on both sides which bucket do you put things in and i think that's sort of emblematic a little bit of, of what we're hearing there's a general sense there's a lot of reference to the taxonomy there's a general sense that you know this is happening it's happening in different speeds in different places but everyone knows that that this is coming down the pike uh, and trying to gear up for it um, I think part of our concern, I mean, I, I think there's a sort of fundamental concern about the challenges in defining some of these things, but that those are more of a technical nature and I'm sure can be can be sorted out. Our main concern, I think, is that there aren't these unintended sort of knock on effects on the poor, uh, that the, the more of these sort of transaction costs that you introduce in the lending, uh, the more that just in, increases uh, the, the, the foundational cost structure that the provider needs to, to uh, meet, right? Um, and uh, there's a real risk then that the poorest clients will not be able to be served anymore with that. So another example from um, a provider we talked to in Southeast Asia who said, look, you know, I have $100 loan clients. Uh, it makes no sense for me to deploy a seven page ESG questionnaire to a $100 loan client. It just, it just doesn't work. So if I have to do that, then I'm not going to serve those clients anymore because it's not worth it. Uh, the, the economic system is stacked up. So I think there is, it's come up a lot. There's a lot of momentum from funders and regulators, banks uh, and in particular, but other French service providers too are very aware of it. Um, uh, and we, we uh, have a few concerns about what that might lead to. Not clear how to avoid those concerns, to be honest, but there needs to be some kind of a waiting maybe uh, and proportionality applied in all of these things so that you have much, uh, you have no or lower requirements uh, on, on some of these things for very small ticket sizes and, and those kinds of things. So as not to have those unintended uh, effects. I don't know if that answers your, your question, but um, I don't know if, if Sylvia, if you have anything to add from the funder side on that. Uh, no, I, I think you actually answered that pretty well. Okay, um, I'm just going to jump in as moderator. I don't see any other questions, but I, I actually have a question. Um, you know, right. some of us were around, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, when, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, supply-driven funding of the sector, and it was very inefficient. Um, and ultimately, I think it worked out that we have developed in many places around the world fairly efficient, uh, fairly effective, inclusive finance systems and institutions, e ecosystems, if you will. Um, my worry about you know climate finance is we we can't afford to be inefficient with this. We have very little time because exactly of what you pointed out peter uh and jamie nailed you know climate redlining you know it, it's at a point where you know you could see a farmer not getting credit even for their production the you know the credit they get every year and it's just going to say there's just too much risk for us here now we just don't know every other year you got a drought so how do we beat that clock i mean how do we beat the clock what do, what have we learned you know from our past experience at actually building a successful uh, inclusive finance sector in many countries, the, what can we use to apply now? How can we go faster and be more efficient with the, the money that we have? Might be an unfair question, but I'm still asking it. 
<laughs> now, if I knew the answer to that, then I, we wouldn't need to do, uh, you know, the work that we're going to do over the next 10 years. Um, so it's a big question. And it's, it's, that is the question. That, that is the question. I don't have the answer. Um, I think the answers, you know, we, we could make a generic statement around sort of combinations of, of different things, like new business models, technology innovation, and so forth. At the end of the day, my personal sense is that there's no way around the role of public finance in this, as we discussed, right? Uh, and that's just, just going to need to be public money come in. And hopefully, in an ideal world, uh, with sort of using the risking uh, techniques, green credit grant guarantees, and, and whatnot, a catalytic capital in various uh, capacities, um, um, funding insurance and reinsurance markets, I think could be a really important component of the puzzle as well. But if we have a number of these different kinds of interventions, we can still um, we can still approach this with the same kind of market building mindset that we've had on financial inclusion and micro credit from the beginning, that it puts public money in to scale the market and then the market will work on its own. To be frank, it's not clear to me that it will, right? And, and for everyone. And, and I think we have to be honest about that. And that's what I meant about this sort of fifth point that, you know, we might need to have an open discussion about the role of public finance here, in, including subsidies and including maybe permanent subsidies. And I think part of the challenge here, right, is it's such a mindset shift for the whole development community. Because, and certainly everyone that works on building markets for the poor, right, which we're all doing in one capacity or another, because the, the sort of central premise there is that I'm going to put in public money now for a while, and I'm going to grow this thing, and then I'm going to exit the public money, and the commercial market will run on its own, right? That's kind of the foundational premise of so much of the work that we've all been doing, certainly of the whole inclusive finance space, right? And with climate change, it's just not, it, the dial is in the opposite direction, right? The dial is, there's gonna be more money needed from the public sector, not less over time, because climate risks are growing, right? Uh, and I think that's gonna be a really difficult mindset shift. Uh, and I think we're, given where we've seen the winds blowing politically around development assistance in, in the global north, that's also a challenge, right? That there's not a lot of appetite to be told, look, you know, your your aid bill is going to quintuple over the next 15 years because uh, you created this huge problem and and the damages are growing rapidly and that's the only way to address it. So I that, that these are my personal views, right? Uh, but I, I find it hard to get away from that. And so the question at some point becomes, how big a part of the space is that going to apply to? So what's the part of the space that we really need to approach in that way, um, as opposed to the more traditional way? So, so the, 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 this sort of more of a social insurance thinking around it, and much more of a permanent investment kind of thing, right? This is just something we're gonna need to do on an ongoing basis. Hmm. And, and maybe there's a different part, or there will be a different part of the space where we can approach it more in the traditional way. Like, oh, we build markets, expand catalytic capital, yeah. and then it will work. And you know, scaling up insurance will help to bring down costs and, and these right. things. But I think we're going to need to draw some lines in the sand and say, this is this thing, and this is the other thing. And those are very different. Those are my personal views. Um, right. I, I don't know. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And I know it's not supposed <laughs> to be dialogue necessarily, but I'd love, oh, to, really love to hear your thoughts and right comments on it. I'm just cognizant of the time. I want to pivot to the next section, the next session, but I will do this by doing a, 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 a promo for the Inclusive Rural Finance Policy of EFAD, which says two things that I think are very important. We need to be demand driven, and we haven't quite figured out what demand looks like for climate adaptation, mitigation a bit more. So that, and the other thing that we said, you raised the S word. Now, our 2009 policy was a bit dogmatic and said, don't distort markets. Well, that was a bit arrogant as well as not right because you build markets, you're gonna to have to distort them. I mean, this is the way it is. And I think our new policy says you have to aim for and provide evidence of plausible sustainability into the future, something to that effect. So we have more flexibility now, but let's go to the funding side of the equation because I am very worried about all the money that's coming out that if we don't make good use of it, we're not going to get any more, and we need lots more. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Sylvia. Over. Thank you, and I can... Sounds good. 
And just to say, I, I love the term plausible sustainability. I'm, I'm, I'm going to use that liberally. Um, excellent. Over to you, Sylvia. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, Mark, I don't think I can answer your, uh, your question, uh, but I can definitely give some more uh, ammunition, some more content um, for us to debate a little bit about where the money goes and how it can be used a little bit more effectively and possibly something we can talk a bit more about it after I'm giving you a little bit of an overview now of what are the current funding trends um, at the nexus of climate and financial inclusion and gender. Um, and we will also look a little bit more closely uh, at what we've been learning on the financial needs of women and girls to become more resilient to climate shocks and stresses. So let me see if I can move the slides. Yes, that seems to work, but that was too quick. Yeah, okay. So let me start just with giving you a few global numbers on climate finance over the past decade, um, around $4.8 trillion were channeled to climate mitigation and adaptation activities. These commitments have been increasing over the past years at an average growth rate of 7%. Um, the growth rate of private climate finance was slightly slower. That was around 5% uh, than that of public sector, uh, which was around 9%. Um, and as we know, this needs to, in needs to increase much more um, and at scale. In the past decade, 75% of all climate finance was concentrated in developed countries. And we also know that most climate finance is raised and spent domestically. So very little climate finance actually goes to um, other countries. Also, um, we know a little bit about the instruments that have been used. So most uh, climate finance is debt, around 60%. and uh, about one third was equity and 5% were grants. And we also know that especially for adaptation and that links a little bit into the discussion that we just had, it, it might need a little bit more grant funding or concessional finance. Um, as you also know, when it comes to developing countries and when it comes to adaptation financing, there's a huge funding gap. In 2019 and 2020, global mitigation finance was over 12 times the amount of global adaptation finance. And whilst there has been a strong growth in adaptation finance over the past two years, especially after COP26 and 27, there continues to be a huge need, and especially in developing countries, uh, which are the most affected, as we know. Most adaptation finance and financing for developing countries is channeled via public funders. Uh, however, the financing uh, for developing countries still remains below the internationally agreed 100 billion year goal that was set at COP15 and 29, and it's far below the needs um, in developing countries. And here's um, some data for Africa, which shows the amount of climate finance that is flowing to Africa um, compared to the cost of their nationally determined contributions. We also know that public funding will not be able to meet those needs um, and it will take considerable private sector investment. Uh, public funders will therefore need to provide much more risk tolerant financing and also support ecosystem building in order to mobilize financing for climate adaptation in developing countries. Blended finance is probably one of the best financing instruments for that. However, uh, funders also need to, so public funders specifically, also need to consider their role as ecosystem builders in addition to uh, promoting blended finance and collaborating with the private sector. So then of course, since we're CGAP and our focus is financial inclusion, we want to look uh, a little bit more closely at how funders are linking their climate funding to financial inclusion and financial sector development funding as well as vice versa. And so we looked at funder strategies and related documents and we also did a couple of interviews uh, with a number of uh, climate and financial inclusion funders. So what we found um, 
on the side of the climate funders is that there are several projects where climate funders are talking about financial services, for example, about payments for ecosystem services or credit lines for green activities by MSMEs or climate risk insurance. However, when we looked at their strategies, climate funders seldom make an explicit connection between climate and financial inclusion. About a third of the 29 public and private development funders that we reviewed in our research are supporting financial inclusion solutions in their climate funding projects or activities, but only 20% of those actually mention it in their strategies um, in some way mentioning like financial products and services are a means uh, to build resilience of more vulnerable populations. So that means that whilst there is already investment in financial services in order to achieve climate goals, there's no intentional um, lever leverage of um, financial inclusion solutions or an intentional focus on building more inclusive financial ecosystems. Amongst the financial inclusion funders, uh, we identified in our last CGAP funder survey, which some of you might know, that's the data on the right side, that several of the financial inclusion funders are already linking their work to SDG 13 for climate action. However, again, very few make actually the strategic link between their financial inclusion work and climate objectives. And that despite a huge push amongst all funders to uh, to contribute to organizational climate objectives and uh, climate co-benefits. Uh, about half of the funders that have a financial inclusion related strategy are making a link to climate change and climate goals. And that is most prominently uh, among their DFIs. Uh, and when DFIs make that linkage, it's quite frequent or in most of the times they identify that link um, in terms of climate change being a risk for the financial sector and for the financial institutions that they're investing in. And only very few are explicitly mentioning opportunities of linking financial inclusion activities with climate adaptation and resilience objectives. So we also found that funders are increasingly adopting a gender lens in their climate strategies and activities. And that speaks also a little bit to the last point that Peter made in his presentation. Uh, over 40% of funders that we reviewed are incorporating gender in their climate strategies, either by highlighting the disproportional uh, impact that climate has on women and girls, or by identifying gender objectives very specifically, or embedding their existing gender equality principles or goals into the climate strategy. It's much more common that funders tag adaptation projects or projects with dual benefits, meaning projects that have a mitigation and adaptation benefit to gender. Um, however, the numbers that are being reported are still much lower than what we think is needed to ensure that climate finance and especially adaptation finance does not compromise gender equality goals. Public funders play again an very important role in promoting gender sensitive and gender responsive finance as they are seeking to mobilize private sector financing. And in fact, data shows that already about a fifth of blended climate finance transactions have been aligned with SDG 5 for gender equality. And just because we were briefly talking about gender, um, I just wanted to uh, make sure we are all uh, on the same page with that. And, and I repeat that again, because it's so important. Um, it, yeah, that it's so important that we consider the needs of women and girls in the context of climate financing. Um, the most important consideration is that climate change is multiplying women's existing vulnerability to economic health and social shocks. And this is why it becomes even more imperative to support women and girls in accessing the tools and resources that help them to manage the multiple risks that they are facing, and especially in the context of a cl changing climate and more frequent and severe shocks. And financial services are an important part of that toolkit. Um, so insurance, savings, access to remittances and government payments and also credit. So for that reason, we also looked more specifically at how 
um, financial services are already being tailored to respond to the climate resilience needs of women and girls. And we found that amongst the financial services that we reviewed, that hardly any of those are designed to respond to women's climate res resilience needs. And as a result of our research, we identified five opportunities for financial services to become more responsive to those needs. And that includes, first of all, that um, there's an opportunity to anticipate second and third order effects, like, for example, um, offering solutions that help women to manage health costs after a climate shock. Also, very importantly, women's preferences need to be incorporated in the product design, and that is still not being done sufficiently. And um, there's a lot of opportunity, as we know from our, our other work on customer centricity and uh, gender responsive uh, financial services. Um, that can be leveraged. Um, and an example of that is that women may respond much better to digital solutions that also have a physical element, um, which we also refer to as digital solutions. So example, the digitization of savings groups, uh, because digital financial services are not always accessible to, to women or not in the same ways as it's accessible to men. So the solutions really have to consider um, how those can be accessed and used and also beneficial. Payments play an important role to avoid disruptions in women's livelihoods. So for example, anticipatory cash transfers could um, support sectors that predominantly employ women, such as healthcare services. Um, but also uh, payments are really important because women are much more likely to rely on remittances to access money in an emergency. And last but not least, uh, regulatory support is still very limited and remains un underexplored. So there's a, an opportunity to do more research and also uh, work with regulators more specifically on consumer protection guidelines and capacity building efforts that ensure that women can access climate responsive financial services and products. And with that, let's uh, move to the chat. I saw some activity in the chat. Um, so maybe we can move to some of those comments first and then we can take up again the, your, your question mark, which I think um, is offering a lot of discussion. Yeah, I'm looking for hands. I'm trying not to, uh, to leave anybody out this time. I apologize to Carlos because uh, I missed his hand. Can anybody see a hand? Anybody want to ask a specific question? I don't see Carlos on the list either anymore. Okay, uh, I don't see any specific questions going forward. Um, why don't we move right into, if there's no questions, let's move right into the next session, which is just to um, get an overview of CGAP's work going forward and your learning agendas. Thanks, Mark, um, and thanks, Sylvia, for that. So uh, based on the sort of foundational phase that we have just wrapped up, as mentioned, um, we are, first of all, we're gonna be publishing what we found in all of these different work streams. We have some short papers written up and are gonna be putting out a publication that summarizes all of this. Um, I think we would be happy to share some of that with you folks informally, if interested, before the, the actual publication is, is written up. Um, so if there's interest in, you know, specific topics uh, around this or specific lenses, um, you know, as mentioned, we, we sort of looked at it through the climate provider, funder, regulator, social protection, and gender lenses, uh, and we're producing a, we have produced right up in each of those like what we sort of learned from this initial six nine month uh, sprint um, we're happy to share and to get into those conversations uh, otherwise yeah we're going to be publishing doing blogs and whatnot and writing it all up um, so so that's uh, sort of the immediate next step beyond that though we are launching a number of different agendas around climate um, and so the first of these is the second phase of the work that I lead, um, in which uh, we, we decided to focus in on financial services providers themselves um, on in a, in a few different ways, so providers and their clients, uh, trying to help both providers and their clients become more climate resilient. 
um, and through, for instance, gathering best practice from client experience providers around the world. What can the likes of Brock Bangladesh, what have they learned along the, line, uh, along the way uh, that the vast majority of financial service providers who have never needed to think about these things need to know about how you get your clients through a climate shock and how you get yourself through a climate shock and, uh, and what do you need from, from your funders and your regulators in that context. We think COVID presents an interesting you know, analog for some of these conversations and might yield some lessons as well as to the response um, uh, in terms of leniency to clients, leniency to providers, and, and sort of reduce requirements in different ways. So but we feel like there's time for, for someone to collate best practice around that and, and that we're well placed to, to do that. Um, we also want to address this sort of supply demand disconnect and work on both the question of what clients really need and what they say they need and what they want and versus what they're getting uh, and try to drive both awareness of what those gaps look like and some innovation on, on the provider side around how we can better meet these, these gaps. Is there a core climate suite of financial services that we can point to and say, these are the foundational pieces that people need to manage their, their climate risk and what does it look like in, in different contexts. So that's gonna be the main thrust of the work that I lead going forward. So we have a three-year agenda sort of diving into this question around providers and, and uh, clients. We have a separate agenda on social protection, which is a big and important one. This builds on the work that CIGA has done in the past on social protection, on GDP payments in particular, digitizing GDP and so forth, uh, and trying to bring this sort of climate adaptive lens to that space we've done piece of foundational research. Again, if you're interested, we have 160 or so slides of, of base research that we did for this, which led to the main conclusion that the social protection space writ large has not thought about climate a whole lot. Uh, there are a few that are out ahead thinking about adaptive social protection, but they're doing it in a pretty limited way. Um, they're thinking about disaster response, period. And we think climate adaptation is much more involved than disaster response. Uh, and that there's lots uh, that, that needs to happen. And some that can be learned from the graduation approach uh, uh, and the economic inclusion approach that, that together has been involved with in the past and how you build long-term uh, resilience to, to things through asset building and so forth. There's a third effort on resilient rural women in climate smart uh, digital economies that's led by Jamie who's on the call and who can no doubt introduce it much more eloquently than I do, but this builds on our work with women in rural and agricultural livelihoods uh, at the intersection of climate smart uh, uh, farming practices, digital economies, uh, and gender transformation and climate adaptation. And wants to aims to try and accelerate the development of gender transformative business models in that space. Uh, we have a fourth work stream around carbon markets led by Max Mattern, who's also on a call and can speak to this if there's interest. Basically, the premise there is, is fairly straightforward. There's a, a lot of money in these markets now, but most of it doesn't reach the core. Uh, and um, even providers who say they want to work with the poor and, and reach the poor, it sometimes is not clear how much money is actually getting through. Sometimes uh, they are having challenges actually getting the money all, all the way down the line to poor people. And we think uh, our hypothesis is that financial inclusion and financial services has a a potentially important role to play in closing that loop uh, between the poor on the ground and the big capital markets uh, at the top. And that that could be partly, uh, potentially also a way to address some of these business model issues and issues around adaptation finance, um, because some of those um, some of those income streams can be used to, to alleviate uh, business model concerns and finance adaptation investments and so forth. That's our hypothesis that we're going to be exploring in that work. Um, and finally, uh, we have a fifth piece around this question of unintended consequences of green finance and the, the risk uh, that some of the actions taken to green the financial sector might have uh, you know, harmful uh, impacts that, that are not being thought about and that we need to think about them before we put something in place that, that we regret later. And, and my mind goes always to 9-11 and all the AML CFT rules that came after that were thought of and, and so forth. And the new barriers that, that threw up for financial inclusion, the de-risking movement that, that ensued and so forth, and all the years of work that it then took to unwind some of those rules uh, and open up space for financial inclusion again. So we want to avoid making similar mistakes. Uh, so we're going to be exploring that space a little bit um, 
further in the, in the fifth effort. So these are the big main five things that we are launching out on, on climate change. Um, I'm happy to take questions on any of that. So are Jamie and Max. I don't know, maybe um, I'm taking liberties, Mark, you're the moderator, but should I invite uh, Max and Jamie if either of you want to add uh, you know, a, a few sentences on your respective pieces of work? I'm worried I didn't do them just. Yeah, let's uh, let's see if there's some questions first, and then maybe we can um, we can. If there's no questions, we'll uh, jump in with those guys. Are there any questions from the floor? I'm trying to do my best to see hands. I know I have. So a point question. out if you don't have any questions for us, then we have questions for you. <laughs> so let's go. Well, I actually I have I have one question. Um, you know, I've sat through a lot of these presentations where they say. Well, there's this enormous gap for adaptation and or mitigation finance for smallholders or for folks in the developing world. Um, and then they say, and look at all this money that's out there in the private sector. Um, we should be able to you know, finance that gap. But I think the, the reality is a lot of that money, either fiduciarily or if that's a word, or legally can't actually get to uh, where it needs to go. So I was wondering if you had any sense uh, of the actual, the size of the actual capital uh, market that could actually be, you know, um, contribute, could actually be invested in uh, either urban or rural finance uh, in developing countries. I, I, I have no idea what that number is. I think it's an important number to establish so that it gets our expectations set. Is that about the carbon markets piece specifically, or, or no, or no, more it's, a, it's about it's about financing adaptation and uh, mitigation for poor folks uh, in developing countries. I mean, who yeah. could actually we have not, make the we have not looked, Yeah, right. I I don't think we have looked at any sort of fiduciary constraint to it, so, and and try to break it down that way. So that's that's an interesting way to. Yeah. Because Peter, if you, the, the yeah, if you look at the $25 trillion or so, you know, market cap, you know, that's liquid, you know, like hardly any of that could legally uh, be invested in the kinds of things that we're interested in them investing in. Other people would know. Carbon market's a different thing. I know, Max, I just saw your face come up on the screen. Maybe it's because it sees you're excited or something. You want to contribute, but... Um, it just seems to me that it's just not a lot of money that could legally or be defended from a fiduciary perspective. I see a hand. Uh, let's take another question. So that's my question. Mathilde, why don't you ask your question? Yeah, thanks, Mark. And thanks very much for this. I have a question about, uh, you know, how do we target the beneficiaries? Because um, I've been struggling quite a lot about, you know, we're trying to uh, target uh, small. We really want uh, financing um, tools for them, but uh, but then are they really the one that will get loans? Um, because, you know, it's very difficult for them then to repay. And, and then when you look. Then we do loans to the very poor farmer to pay back his chicken, and then we give some grants to the bigger ones. So I'm just wondering, like, you know, if there is, uh, yeah, adapting a little bit better the financial product that we're offering to uh, the very the poorest. Yeah, you were cutting out a little bit, kind of cutting in and out there a little bit for me, but uh, I. The question I heard is, to what extent do we need to innovate on products to make them fit better? Uh, our hypothesis is absolutely we do. Uh, our conclusion from, from the initial work that we've done in the space is that there's not a lot happening in that space, uh, that there's very little product innovation happening. We went out and did a product scan to say, if we, if we go out there and we try to find any financial services, product or service, uh, in poor country context and, and addressing sort of low income uh, countries and communities, what can we find that mentions the word climate in some way or addresses a climate risk in some way in an explicit manner? And there was very little out there to find. We ended up finding a hundred or so products, uh, the majority of which were ag index insurance. So like about half, I think, were ag index products straight up. So that's 
by far the most well-developed part of the space it was sort of our conclusion from that. Um, there was some lending for livelihood diversification that explicitly had a, a climate angle to it. So it said, you know, the lo loans that were bundled with some TA to help people switch into agroforestry, right? Or, or what it might be uh, that sort of explicitly had a, a climate element to both the, the, the sort of rationale for the loan, the TA and the, and the product itself. So there were a few things like that, but uh, then there wasn't a whole lot more actually. So our general takeaway is that there's a lot more innovation that needs to happen in this space. That then the providers aren't doing it because they don't feel like they understand climate change. It still feels abstract and technical and complicated, and they don't know what to do with it. Um, so that's part of the concern. Um, so that's a long way of saying, I think absolutely you're right that we do need more product innovation in this space. And that's one of the things that, that we hope to help work on, both to put a spotlight on that and to actually drive some innovation. But I Maybe don't know if others I, want to jump in. Yeah, if I can just add, because I heard you also saying like how to target the beneficiaries and maybe what's the need for different types of segments of for different types of services. I think it speaks A, to the need to provide tools for financial service providers to better tailor their products. And it might not necessarily need to be a different type of product, but it might also just need to be marketed in a different way to speak to certain population groups. The other point that comes to my mind when you were talking about targeting and, and, and it speaks a little bit to what we were mentioning about the risk of exclusion because there are those green lending requirements and certain segments might not be able to report uh, on those requirements or meet those requirements necessarily because they're just too small and it might also just make it much harder to lend to smaller um, smaller borrowers, for example, um, if they have to also check several, um, uh, yeah, the several uh, things on their list. So an idea could be that certain um, amounts of lending don't need to comply with certain requirements or that they don't need to um, meet certain um, criteria and um, standards. Um, so kind of exclusion lists to the exclusion lists, uh, let's say, or that certain activities, if they are too very small, then they don't necessarily need to um, be considered um, within those green lending guidelines or, or requirements. So that's also something that we will be looking at more closely in that um, work stream that we have here at the very bottom. Um, how can regulators as well as funders um, ensure that their requirements to reduce the risk that financial institutions are exposing themselves to, um, that that doesn't lead to exclusion of the most vulnerable and the smallest. Dushyam, I see your hand up, please go ahead. Thanks, Mark, and thanks to the CGAP colleagues for their presentations. Um, so it's come up a few times in the in the discussion how how important it is to have a conducive regulatory environment. Um, so I, I wanted to know, in your experience or from your research, uh, what are some of the best practices in terms of regulatory support that you've seen in in, in, in the countries where you have worked um, in terms of giving additional incentives or removing barriers or, um, yeah, well, what are some of the best practices that you've seen that are really working um, in terms of shifting, uh, shifting the needle in, in enhancing uh, investment in climate adaptation? Um, yeah, so it'd be good to hear what, what, what you're seeing, what you're, what you're finding. Thank you. Thanks for that. So the short answer is that, that we are now looking at the question of best practices. Um, we, we didn't come in with that lens specifically, and that's work that we're doing right now and we'll be sharing out in the, in the near future. I think we're still very much, we're focusing on two things uh, in much of our work on this going forward. One is this risk of unintended consequences from what is happening in the effort to green uh, the financial sector probably because there's so much momentum behind that, that we need to get ahead of it, that train uh, before it goes um, in the wrong direction. And the other is uh, what what the regulatory environment can do to support financial service providers and their clients through a climate shock. Um, 
we have not looked at the broader question of how the regulatory environment can uh, enable or, or catalyze or, or best sort of channel adaptation finance, which is what I understood your question to be about. Um, but I wonder if that might be something that comes up in, in your work, Max, on, on carbon markets. Um, not sure. I mean, to be completely honest with you, the work on carbon markets, I mean, we're at a very sort of nascent stage right now, but, but I do think that it's something that we're very much um, keeping in our scope. So, I mean, as we kind of narrow in on a few topics that we'll focus on, I do think that a regular, the regulatory environment will play a role. I think that when it comes to carbon markets, though, we are really looking at um, kind of how do you ensure that regulation is proportional? Because I, I do think that um, there is a risk that when governments do see a lot of money flowing to communities that, um, you know, there might be uh, efforts to say tax it or, or take kind of greater control over project development. And so I think we're we're approaching the topic of regulation with um, kind of some caution um, where we are really looking at um, at regulation is, is more in terms of um, consumer protection, because there are a lot of predatory uh, potentials for predatory practices um, when it comes to project developers coming into communities, promising all kinds of future benefits. And um, in reality, um, those never materialize despite the significant upfront investments that, that households might need to make, um, the short-term losses and productivity that might come with um, steps like adopting regenerative agriculture, et cetera. So I think that's more what we're thinking of, but clearly, you know, it's an early stage. So we'd be happy to, to discuss with you um, where we might be um, best served by, by focusing. I don't see any, uh, see any hands. Um, I feel free to jump in and we can have uh, much, we can go as informal as you want to. Um, I, I wanted to bring to, to our attention uh, a, a policy thing that's been interesting to follow in Sudan. Um, the Central Bank of Sudan just had some guidelines developed for uh, quote unquote green uh, inclusive finance. And it's certainly got a lot of interest here. And it was actually um, that and some piloting activities by a German fintech called Yapu with EFAD has generated actually quite a lot of uh, interest uh, in developing products and services. And in fact, uh, the financial, uh, the microfinance institutions that we've been talking with are sort of lining up now to, to um, uh, join in the initiative of this pilot. And the interesting part of the pilot is that it's, uh, it's a digital app that you walk out into the field with, and it brings down all the NASA data, all the CIGAR data, all this different data, and can give a relatively good uh, climate volatility uh, impact uh, risk management assessment of a, of a crop in a particular area. And so these two things combine some active activity on the ground uh, with providers, as well as, you know, the, the, some solid and demonstrable interest from the uh, policy uh, people, it, it seems to be generating quite a bit of interest and maybe we'll see some developments in the next little while. I'm just wondering if, if we can cast pack cast backwards into our history is what was it, what was the combination of things that you know really started to see some momentum building in inclusive finance in any given country at once you know what's is there a magic combination that we should be looking for or anybody can jump in jamie if you feel like it Hello, anybody there? <laughs> yeah, I think it's a hard question. <laughs> I don't, don't know that anybody has the magic combination, right? Um, I mean, the, there was this, I feel like at the country level, I mean, at the global level, there was this confluence of, of, of uh, perspectives around financial services, the, the sort of profitability approach to serving the poor, right? That sort of took overhand they were after the, the long debate between commercial microfinance and NGO style microfinance um, and the commercially oriented ones kind of won over the day and that combined with this uh, unlocking of new private capital that wanted to go around the world and, and serve triple bottom lines and whatnot. 
Yeah, and that in combination with conducive regulatory environments, right? But I, I, I don't know that it's more magic than that. Impact evidence certainly played a role. Yeah, sorry, I'm just freewheeling on what, what those combinations were, but it's an, I think it's an interesting question. Part of the question here is how much of that is, is, is applicable, right, given that what we've talked about, um, but maybe being able to articulate what that looked like before and which parts of it are versus are not applicable today or to the present problem would be a useful thing to do. Well, maybe if I may jump in, just a reflection on some of our work with funders more generally uh, around uh, supporting financial inclusion, something that we've seen that has not always worked that well is when there was a sole focus on the supply side and it still tends to be that right especially in the climate finance discussions that there's primarily a focus on supporting financial institutions and pushing that they um on land green funding and it misses the important work that needs to happen on the demand side, because where there is no demand and where you don't have the means to create a demand, you will also not succeed. And then also the ecosystem and the uh, enabling environment, which includes policy, but then also data, especially in the context of climate, we, we really need more data. There's far too little data that would also enable to pro develop much more tailored products that would enable financial service providers to uh, better understand the risk that they are exposing themselves to when they serve certain population groups um so, so i think it the problem is that it needs to be that combination of different things and particularly the public funders play a critical role in looking beyond the supply side and looking at the enabling environment and diagnosing before they go into a market where are the key challenges and barriers for for um, vulnerable populations to access the financial services that would help them in, in becoming more climate resilient and adapt to climate change. So looking at what is it in, in the overall environment, um, how can they also leverage their advocacy role in uh, advocating for better practices at the policy level, um, helping to develop the institutions and the supporting functions that are needed in the um, ecosystem. So that's just a reflection that that I have based on the work that we done around financial inclusion as well. Thanks, thanks, Sylvia. I think maybe I'll take if there's any. Is there any questions? Uh, any questions from the floor? I see some messages uh, in the chat box, but I can't read them. Uh, if there's no no more questions from the floor, maybe I'll wrap up a little bit um, and then do a bit of promo before everybody takes off. Are there any more questions? Just jump in if you have a question. Would, would we be allowed to also ask a question to your colleagues? Because it would really be interesting to hear also from your experiences in your Absolutely. work. Like, Absolutely. How does this resonate, what we are finding? Do you see something similar in your work? Uh, what, what are the challenges that you're facing as you try to maybe implement your inclusive fi role finance policy, right? Or as you um, are working at the nexus of financial inclusion climate. So we'd also be very keen to hear some of your experience. And also where can we be helpful, right? What a CGAP uh, could do to support you in your work. Um, so my colleague, I'm happy to jump in, but I, Hesham, Solly, uh, Mathilde, others want to jump in? Hi, Mark. This is Sally speaking. Hey, Sally. Hey. Um, yeah, to Sylvia's question. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a good point. Thank you very much for asking. Like uh, whether it resonates and whether the, the findings that you have make sense from our point of view. And, and Mark, I think I can concur that from Eastern and Southern Africa region, it's it's those those same pertinent topics that you had mentioned. Uh, how do we mobilize more financing into this space and make sure that it goes to the right target groups and and, and, and how can we ensure that it has the type of impact that we expect it to, to have? We are developing a quite a large initiative for green financing, specifically for adaptation in Eastern Africa through private sectors. So we want to finance or provide a credit line financing specifically for climate adaptation through two large commercial banks in Eastern Southern Africa and expect it to, um, to be utilized only for climate adaptation purposes. 
And then obviously the issue or the difficulty is a little bit to, to agree on the eligibility criteria for the investment, since it's going to be slightly concessional credit, then what can we accept to be, to be utilized for, uh, uh, what type of target groups? And then we have the extra difficulty of if at only financing the poor and the low income uh, uh, target groups uh, in the rural and in the most difficult areas. So we have to ask the bank to do commercial lending to climate adaptation purposes, which is new line of products. And we ask them to do only the most difficult target groups for commercial lending. So it's a kind of a difficult equation, but then we offer them TA and we offer them, um, and then we offer them a um, uh, uh, constitutionality of the credit line that uh, that enables them to make a slightly bigger profit uh, that, in a, that in a way uh, incentivizes them to go to the target groups that we require them to go to, which they otherwise wouldn't be doing. So. So that's in a way the, the in a very short summary what we what we're trying to do in in in, in this region here uh, here based out of Nairobi uh, and um, uh, yeah um, I I don't know like um, what could be your role or your support um, every now and then I have a chat with a Jamie uh, who is here so we exchange ideas and thoughts and he gives us like ideas on who we should go and contact and talk to and so on. Um, but outside that, I don't know from your um, working, from your work, from your desk, I don't know if there's like uh, anything specific that you would like to support in a larger initiative like that. This, the volume of that investment is, is, is bigger compared to what we do normally with private sector. So maybe that, that gives an incentive possibly for your involvement. But I don't know. SIGAP, I know, is a more high level institution and not so much um, always project by project. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Yep. Organizing. And uh, I see Anne has a hand. Go ahead, Anne. Uh, well, thanks. I'm responding, I think, to a question that was asked by Sylvia. And I, I just wanted to say, to make an observation, that I, I still believe, I still think, I still see, uh, at least for us on the ground, in the if I supported for our projects, and in this case, I'm talking about the very small, small, small scale farmers. That there are we we have not yet really figured out the products that actually work as agricultural finance specifically so you'll have uh, people accessing financing from you know financial institutions uh, or you know rural finance institutions but they are not necessarily your your random small scale farmers. These are people who happen to be doing something other than just small scale farming. And for me, my my struggle was always, okay, what really would work as a product, an agricultural inclusive finance product for a small scale farmer that is supposed to get them from one place to another? Of course, you know better than I do that the reasons are mainly because they're very small scale farmers don't have actually the proper access to productive resources, land or anything else that they can offer. Uh, and I was intrigued by the, this conversation, especially on the climate agenda and on carbon markets. Is, this is where I, I think that we have a real possibility to, to provide products for small scale farmers who would actually not have a chance otherwise. However, there has also been the argument that I ah, know if we give cheap um, if, uh, access to, to, to finance, uh, then we, we disbalance the market. So <laughs> I'm still stuck right there in the middle. And I would like to, to hear the views of the other experts here, because I think it's a debate that has been going on and on and on, especially now that we are beginning to access uh, financing for like green financing, if I may say. Thank you, Anova. Great, thanks. And I'd like to jump in a bit. I mentioned earlier that we have in our uh, in our pilot in Sudan, we were looking. We asked the experts and lenders and the extension services and government and et cetera, et cetera, a whole long list of stakeholders to provide their thoughts on what might be financeable from an adaptation uh, perspective. And I was quite shocked when the list came back at 120 different. Um, 120 different potential 
uh, technologies, if you will, that we could invest in. Some of them were relatively simple. And I was sitting with a, in a meeting of uh, people today that um, at the, in the Sudanese Min uh, Ministry of Agriculture, and they just said the recommendation that they had is simple with immediate returns. I mean, I think that that's the reality of uh, the reality of most smallholder households is they can't wait for two, three, four, five years for a return. Now, that gets me start to thinking about, well, if a larger asset uh, technology is, is gonna help them out more in the long term, but they can't afford it in the short term, how can we structure financing to get them there? You know, we've used matching grants in the past. Uh, we've used, you know, sort of bonus programs. We've used all sorts of techniques that uh, grace periods that would allow uh, smallholders to take a larger loan. And I think it's time now we had to think about these things. However, having said that, the uh, public development bank platform that uh, uh, our colleagues are working on here, Christian Fusilet, they did a survey recently of green products through public development banks. Um, and they found uh, a number of interesting ones, particularly out of Nabarb in, uh, Nabarb, sorry, in India. So there is some growing uh, collection of products and services. And I think that that's something that we could really use some help on is finding out where some products are working and how they've been taken to scale. So that would be a comment that I would have. Anybody wanna jump in? Mark, I'll just jump in to say that I, I think that that's a good idea, but I would also suggest that we get away from an idea that one service provider needs to provide the one product that's gonna work for a mass market, whether it's small holders or women, and instead think about Sylvia's point about understanding demand, and then more specifically around collaboration, about how we bundle services, how we combine services, financial and non-financial services, and how we work across organizations. Because these, as we all know on this call, this, these challenges are so complex that there's not one organization, be it private sector, public sector, social enterprise, that has the mandate or the experience or the reach to solve all of these questions. We need to think in more partnerships as well. Yeah. Okay, well, if there is any last question or comment. Uh, sorry, uh, not a question, but to Jenny's point, then who coordinates this uh, kind of uh, mechanism? Because yes, indeed, there may not be one solution that fits all, not one organization that responds to all, but I think that there is a need for uh, a coordination effort to ensure that we're able to meet the differentiated needs without duplicating, without stepping on each other's toes and ETC. And I, I, I believe perhaps there's, there's something like that that exists. And uh, if, if someone has an idea, they could share. But without that, we will continue to struggle with the same struggles. Over. And that's a good question. And I'm just going to jump in to say, I think IFAD is well positioned to do that as a global multilateral working with uh, strong partners like CGAP. Great, thanks, Jamie. Look, we're coming up to the top of the hour. This has been great. I really appreciate CGAP, um, Sylvia, Peter, Max, Jamie, others that have been involved in all the hard work and thinking that's going into their climate work uh, amongst other activities that they undertake. I, I don't think I'll, I'll try to summarize a lot here other than to say we have both demand and supply issues that we have to deal with. We have analogies from you know, the past rise and emergence of inclusive rural finance. And I think the need here for us is to keep our eye on the ball, to try and be as efficient as we can and quick as we can to avoid, I think, the biggest danger, which we've tapped today is green redlining or red green lining or climate redlining. I think it's important, and I've never actually thought of that concept. And I think for me, I really would like to thank you for bringing that up because I think it's a real danger. It's a huge danger. So climate lining, that sounds like something you put in your closet. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I kind of like climate redlining because it, it resonates quickly and you get to the point quickly. But I would also like to say is that we, we need to push on the blended finance side. We need to understand what money can actually come and go get it, go grab it. And we have to be smart about that. And I think on the product side, we have tons to learn. There's probably more products out there than we know. And, 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 and the cowboy in me, the you know, sort of the free market cowboy in me says, 
let's just find all the products. Let's ta make a taxonomy of the products and get it out there, get it out there and let people try. Because, you know, we're gonna make mistakes, but we have to make them faster this time than we made them before. And, and we gotta stop trying to talk this big language. And this is where my fear comes. And I'll end with this, is that I've been to a lot of conferences on the private sector helping with development, the private sector helping with climate, inclusive fine, all these things. And it's always, oh, we have to have this whole big coordinated effort. I don't know if we have, do we have time for that? I don't know. Um, maybe we just have to be really conscious about how we attack this pro, uh, the, the chaos that is coming and try and figure out, you know, to be fast on our analytics so that we say, we tried that, didn't work, tried it, didn't work. Here's something that worked and move ahead. Anyways, that's my opinion. I think that Jamie's right. Ultimately, EFAD and CGAP have lots of good things to do together. And I really want to thank you again. I want to thank Anais, who's come on board and helped us promote. Uh, at the last minute, none, uh, 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 even. Um, and I want to promote the next uh, event, which is coming up at the end of March, date to be uh, determined exactly. Uh, and we are going to compare and contrast what uh, CGAP found and what the Center for Financial Inclusion has found with their slightly uh, less high in the air perspective, a little bit closer to the ground. And then from that, we'll be moving on into the future, look, looking at products and services amongst other issues uh, in inclusive finance. So with that, I would like to thank everybody one more time and uh, wish you a good evening, afternoon or morning.